major campus, the main campus, where most of the um, most of the action takes place, is uh, in in the city of Vancouver, which is Canada's uh, third largest city after Toronto and um, Montreal. Uh, it's uh, got nicer weather. Interesting picture that I chose there. Eh? Um, <laughs> um, it's snow, uh, wet snow, but uh, the, the truth of the matter is, it, it's a uh, it's a wet climate, but it's very rarely snowy there. Uh, we don't get it like the snow, the snow in Eastern Canada is far more. And of course, uh, Vancouver is uh, the largest city in British Columbia. And it is a city that is the most vibrant, um, the, also the one with the closest connections to Asia, um, partly because of where it is physically, but also uh, where it is also uh, aesthetically and intellectually. There's a lot of connections between um, Asia in, in Vancouver. So Point Grey, which is where the campus is, is, is down right on the water, right very close to the downtown. You can walk to downtown from Point Grey. Um, I, I commented that, that, that the, uh, the climate there has hot, dry summers. I, I, I realize I'm talking to uh, people who are uh, in some cases from India and, and um, points that have a lot hotter uh, summers than, than Canada does. Uh, when I say hot, I mean 30 degrees, not 40 degrees. Um, there was a little bit of snow, uh, and that's the, the campus. There's a second campus, which is actually uh, much smaller. It's only 10,000 students, um, and it's in the town of Kelowna, which is in the interior. The way that the, the topography of Canada works is it's sort of, uh, if, this is, if this is the west coast and this is the east coast, there's uh, a big mountains, and then there's flat, and then there's on the rest of the country. And uh, the interior is on the other side of the mountains. So <clears throat> it tends to be quite um, wet and a little bit colder. It's still not extremely cold. It's just uh, uh, a little bit more. And the larger campus, of course, is in um, uh, uh, Vancouver. So that's probably the place that you would end up going because most of, most of the Kelowna campus is devoted to environmental studies and uh, forestry. Uh, which don't tend to be a uh, huge subject of interest for, uh, especially for international students. It's, it's, um, and it's uh, tends to be very much uh, local locally because the, it's in the forest there. Now here's a list of the top schools according to uh, uh, various different uh, rate ranking systems and ratings. Um, the QS world ranking is the one that's the most generally uh, broad. Uh, it looks at a number of different factors that determine the quality of the university. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't place a great deal of faith in the specific numbers, but I do place a great deal of faith in the, the generalized numbers. So no, in other words, University of Toronto has been consistently um, rated the highest ranking university in Canada. However, it is also the largest. And from the perspective of the student, which is the perspective I keep trying to go, go back to, um, I would say that it is uh, it is the the least personal university that you can study at in Canada as well. It's very large. Uh, it's known for being very efficient uh, and very business oriented, which is a great for a number of things. It's not the greatest thing necessarily, though, for a student. The University of British Columbia, nearly the same size university, nearly the same um, number of students, has a lot more international students. <clears throat> which uh, frankly, the University of Toronto and the University of British Columbia are the two with the largest number of uh, international students. Uh, and the largest cohort of international students in the University of British Columbia are from uh, India and China. So if that's something that you're interested in and you're not uh, trying to get rid of all, all, all of your connections, then, then that's something to consider. Um, I only say that because I, I know that when I went to McGill University, um, I was surrounded by uh, a lot of Americans who wanted to uh, not have any connection with other Americans. Um, you can see that the other universities in Canada are also ranked fairly high. <clears throat> the other thing that's, uh, 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 that I want to draw your attention to is that the, the right-hand column, which is the entrance average, I would place next to no um, importance on that specific number, except to say this, the number is the absolute lowest that you could think of because, um, in most cases, the University of British Columbia, if you have an 88 average, it won't really be good enough to, to, to get in. You're really looking at in the 90s, but I think that's a general, general rule with most of the better universities. So, um, and there's ways of making, the, making your average higher, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, here's some general information about the university. It's, um, there are 11,000 uh, first-year students each year. 
So, um, you know, uh, we have, we have, as I think Akash mentioned, we have some, some students who had um, come here for advice and they ended up getting into the University of British Columbia, which is great. It's consistently rated in the top 40 univers international universities. Um, this is important to know because there's a consistency to the University of British Columbia. It's been that way for a, a long period of time. Uh, also, 30% of the students are international students. <clears throat> Uh, and I think that the the, the general uh, point that you want to take from this is the the entrance average is between 80 and 91 percent uh, as as a low point. Now here are some notable programs, um, and I'll just say a little bit about each one of them because there's a lot of a long list here, and some of them are more relevant and, than others. Uh, for example, forestry is listed right at the top there. Forestry is at the Kelowna campus, and for the most part, forestry is a very specific to uh, North American forestry. So I'd, uh, I, I'm not totally sure that it would be necessarily all that relevant unless that's a particular area of interest for you. Uh, geography, though, is, is uh, a subject that it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've, I've done a bit of a deep dive into the geography programs over uh, all the universities in Canada. And it's interesting that ge geography in British Columbia is very, uh, first of all, it has interesting geography. But second of all, it's um, uh, a, an area of great development right now because of the, the focus on environmental uh, studies. We also transportation science and technology, which is sort of uh, more in the area of uh, engineering, sports sciences, telecommunications, which are, um, well, I'm doing it right now. So you know that that's an important area of growth. Um, ecology as well, which is becoming uh, more and more important as uh, the days go by. Uh, of course, uh, education and scientific disciplines are important. International relations, uh, and there is a close uh, connection with a lot of international things. It's very close to the United States. It's also very close to uh, both China and I was going to say very close to India, but it's uh, it's it's it's, psych it's psychically close to India. It's not physically all that close, uh, but international relations is an important uh, imaging science and photographic technology are uh, things that are principally deal dealt with in the uh, medical faculty. Uh, biodiversity conservation is closely related to um, uh, uh, environmentalism. <clears throat> then there's, uh, I, I highlighted evolutionary biology, computer science and software engineering, because those are uh, areas of great growth in the university that have seen a lot of development and a lot of funding in the last few years. Uh, transportation, of course, fisheries, because it's on the coast, uh, uh, urban studies and physiology are all areas of great importance there. <clears throat> now, here's a little bit uh, that you should, that you would might want to know about um, the history of the United uh, of the University of British Columbia. There are eight Nobel Prize winners that are faculty members or were faculty members there. Uh, three Canadian prime ministers have attended the University of British Columbia, including our current prime minister, who is pictured there. Uh, he's the one in color. Uh, and uh, there are also uh, 20 3M National Teaching Fellows. Um, the reason why I wanted to point that out is because the, the university is actually renowned as a teaching university, even more so than a research university, which is, uh, and that may not mean a great deal to you right now, but the distinction I'm making is between a university that is undergraduate focused and a university that is graduate focused. Um, so, for example, if you are thinking of going to one of the Ivy League universities in the United States or, or uh, one of the universities in uh, the UK, like Oxford or Cambridge, they are primarily uh, research universities. Uh, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, all these are, are known as research universities. What that often means, and it doesn't always mean it, but what it often means is that when you're an undergraduate student, you are being taught by graduate students and not necessarily by the professors. Um, that is that is somewhat true also at the University of Toronto, it being a research university, but it's not very true at the University of British Columbia. So the reason why there, it's important to know that there are 23M National Teaching Fellows is because you're going to have those people as your professors. Um, it may or may not be a good thing. For most people, it is a good thing. So that's why I mentioned it. Um, in sports, of course, UBC has always been very um, strong. They have 58 Olympic medalists. Um, and 71 Rhodes Scholars, uh, three of them just in the last five years, at least three that I could find. There may even be more by now. And there's 266 Royal Society of Canada Fellows. These are, the, the, these are distinguished Canadians in their, in their, uh, in their fields. Uh, these are the, the uh, Nobel laureates. Um, you'll notice that there's a preponderance of, of economics um, specialists. There's Richard Taller and Daniel Kahneman, uh, who are 
very famous in in the academic world and known broadly in other fields as well. Uh, but the uh, especially D Daniel Kahneman, there's a wonderful book that he wrote um, a couple of years ago that um, that won the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Carl Weiman, uh, Robert Mundell, who's also an economist, uh, Bertrand Brockhaus, who's a physicist, uh, Michael Smith in chem chemistry, uh, Hans Demelt in physics, and uh, Har Koben Korana in medicine. That was in 1968. Now, here's some of the connections that are probably uh, going to be of interest to you. These, uh, the regional offices for the University of British Columbia, I don't know why they put it that way, because actually, if you go the other direction, which is the way you would actually fly, um, they'd be closer. But um, the UBC does have uh, a, a two Asia Pacific regional offices. One of them is currently in Hong Kong, and the other one is in uh, New Delhi, <clears throat> and it's associated with the University of Delhi. Um, now these uh, facilitate various things, including teaching and research partnerships, and they also support the alumni. Uh, this speaks to a couple of issues. One of them is that there are an increasingly large number of graduates who are living in the area of New Delhi and the area of Hong Kong. So uh, just think about that. It's a, it's a university that has an interest in developing its Asia connections. Um, that can't be said of every university in Canada for sure. UBC off, uh, also offers co-op programs. Why am I mentioning this? Why is this important? Uh, at the very bottom, it says all co-op positions are paid. Bottom line, I know the truth. Univer going to university is expensive. It costs money. You have to get money from somewhere. This is the best way by far of getting that money. Uh, the reason number one is because you, you can earn the money back that you paid. Uh, in some cases in one year. And number two is that you are working in your field and making connections in your field. I cannot stress how important that is. It's incredibly important and incredibly valuable. Uh, in what areas are these co-ops? The co-ops are in humanities and social sciences, which is a program that after your first year you apply to it. So you, you uh, th and the reason for this is that humanities and social sciences tend to be non-specific in the first year. You take general, stu uh, general studies in various different fields and you specialize in your second year. And uh, often when you, when you do the um, humanities or social sciences co-op, the result of this is that you end up uh, gaining professional experience, which often leads to a full-time job and often leads to uh, either connections in your home country or connections in Canada. Uh, engineering has a very strong co-op program as well. Uh, business management, of course, uh, has, has one, but that, those ones take place in the later years of the program. Um, forestry, which is possibly less, in, uh, less relevant, but it is much more integrated into the program. And that's the reason why it's in Kelowna, because of the, the forest being there, there's actually a lot of uh, forest ma management uh, techniques that are used in the co-op programs. And it's, uh, almost every student in the forestry program does the co-op. Um, there's also one in kinesiology and human kinetics, which often leads to medical school. And then there's land and food systems and sciences. You know, all these are paid and are uh, valuable in more ways than simply uh, dollars. Um, how do you apply to the University of British Columbia? Well, um, all the universities in Ontario, for example, all do it through the same uh, little portal that you go to. Uh, the same is true of British Columbia. You go to the apply.educationplannerbc.ca, BC is for British Columbia, .ca. So you apply to admission through this uh, by applying through here. And uh, for that matter, you can apply to other universities as well. And you'll notice here, they're, they're, they're listed as the uh, University of British Columbia, uh, the University of Victoria, which is a much smaller, but quite a very good university. It's, one, it's almost like a, like a liberal arts college. The BC Institute of Technology, uh, which is increasingly uh, uh, coming up in conversations about technology, and Royal Roads University, which is traditionally a military school. It is no longer, but it, it has been traditionally a mi military school. And those are the four, uni the four universities that are in uh, the province of British Columbia, which is the westernmost province. Um, the, the, dead, uh, the deadline to apply for, uh, of course, has already passed, but the deadline to apply is at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, on January the 15th, 2021. Um, the reason we didn't change it to 2022 is because uh, they haven't actually officially released their date, but uh, there's reason to believe it'll also be January 15th, 2022. Um, 
obviously admission to UBC is not granted on a first come first serve basis, but if you're a Canadian citizen or permanent resident of Canada, and if you'd like to be considered for the Presidential Scholars Award, you must apply by December the 1st. Um, what this really speaks to is not, I know most of you are not residents of Canada or Canadian citizens, but um, the idea of getting your application in early is very good in some universities and not, not as important in others. At University of British Columbia, it is actually pretty important not to have it in at the very last minute. Um, not that it's going to affect your uh, application, but because um, there are often things that are overlooked. There's uh, the, the specific entry requirements for, uh, for a whole number, a whole host of different subjects from applied biology, uh, applied science, arts even has, has uh, its own um, requirements, uh, the Bachelor of Management uh, and, and, and the Master of Management Studies. Uh, also, commerce. There, there are specific things: dental hygiene, design, and architecture. Um, architecture is a, a, a complicated program. It's quite different from all the others, and it's longer uh, and and more specialized. So, it's a, I, I'm not going to dwell on that right now, unless there's people have specific uh, questions about the architecture program. Uh, similarly, with the creative writing and uh, fine arts programs, which are also quite different. <clears throat> Uh, food, nutrition, and health, forestry, uh, bioeconomy sciences, and technology, forest sciences, and all those are all in the same area of the Kelowna campus. Uh, international economics, kinesiology, uh, media studies, of course, because you'll have to have a, a demo reel. Same with music, you'll have to have a demo tape. Uh, pharmaceutical sciences, science, and wood products processing, which I'll be honest, I don't know much about wood products processing. Now, uh, Program specific entry requirements. <clears throat> this is um, specifically tailored towards Indian students. Um, in applied engineering, the minimum requirements, of course, um, and to be honest, I shouldn't say, of course, I don't know if this is, this is uh, obvious, but when you're applying to an engineering program, you will need to have advanced math, advanced chemistry, and advanced physics, that is standard 12th level. Uh, and also some uh, related courses, uh, Obviously, you'll need to have mathematics and computation and sciences, um, but you also have to have language uh, arts. And what I mean by that is that you're you're going to need to make sure that, especially English, is a um, is a, a language that you have covered well. Um, now, the grades that you'll need to be considered for an offered uh, admission at University of British Columbia differ by degree and from year to year, uh, but what they say here is on, on, uh, from from India. Uh, a percentage average of 85, which is, you notice, a little bit lower. And this speaks to the quality of education in um, India in general. Uh, similarly, applied science and engineering, the minimum requirements are, uh, I, uh, many of you know about the IB program. Um, some of you know it better than I do, but you'll need uh, uh, IB math analysis and approaches, um, either standard level or higher level, uh, or IB math applications and interpretations, higher level. Um, also chemistry, also physics. Uh, and academically strong candidates missing one of these may be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, my advice to you is if you're planning for either uh, next year or the year after, do make sure that you have those. Um, it's not worth it to, to, to skip it. Um, also the same, similarly, uh, need the language arts, mathematics and computation and uh, sciences programs for these. Um, this is the International Baccalaureate Program. Uh, if you're not in that program, then I suppose it's not relevant, but I, I, I think it's, uh, it's all often looked at very favorably in North America, the IB program. Uh, for the application requirements, general admission requirements, graduation from a, a university preparatory pro program, which means high school at a senior secondary school. You'll need higher secondary school certificate awarded on completion of standard 12. Our certificates must be official, of course, um, but that's standard. Everybody knows that, I think. And if you don't know that, now you do. Uh, photocopies are acceptable if certified by the school principal, the head or counselor. Uh, and, uh, but notabi notarized copies are not acceptable. I'm not sure why this is. I've never really understood why this is. The, the point is that uh, I don't think there's been a lot of people forging these things, but it's just something to keep in mind. Try to get the official transcripts. Um, I know that many, many years ago, I, I was applying to do a, uh, a graduate program at University of Toronto, and they were very particular about having all of my uh, credentials from before. And of course, I'd, I'd gone to 
to three different universities before I did my graduate stuff. And so I had a lot of trouble getting these things, uh, but they did demand it and I did have to get it. So it's uh, something to think about and to pre-plan if possible. Um, for the general admission requirements for, again, for IB schools is the IB uh, diploma, including at least three higher level courses. Uh, and in most subject areas uh, uh, that are of interest uh, to students in this uh, program anyway, uh, you do need to have the math and you do need to have the sciences. <clears throat> so you need the hi higher or standard level, um, which depending on what program you're in, and, and they're all very specific for different programs. And as you can see, there's a huge number of programs to go into. I highly recommend that you go to the UBC website and look at the program requirements because overlooking one small thing can affect your application. So please try your best not not to overlook that and do go directly to the source to the, that's why it's helpful to have the website. They are very specific and exactly what they need and make sure that you do that and plan at least a year ahead. Students who complete the IB program in, in English are not required to, um, to prove their facility with English. That, it, that's a presumption thing. However, you do need to have a minimum score of three in an IB uh, English course in the standard or higher level. That's essentially the proof rather than having the, the language tests. IB math applications and interpretations, uh, senior level IB math studies do not satisfy the math requirement for admission to the science programs, the management program, and the business program, or the economics program. Um, so you'll, you'll need to have the higher level math in specific areas. Um, now here's some exemptions for English proficiency. English proficiency, of course, the reason why this is relevant and why it's important is because the language of instruction is in English. Uh, most of the professors are uh, English first language speakers. Um, having said that, many of them are from international uh, uh, schools, but English is their language of instruction for sure. So in the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, uh, you, if, if you're doing that program, you won't need to take a language uh, course. Uh, if you go to uh, one of the Council of International Schools, you won't have to as well. Uh, or that schools that offer regionally accredited U.S. Canadian curricula, there are some in in uh, uh, India and in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, also, the British curriculum and the India Indian secondary school curricula, which are uh, th that are taught in English. So, if you have achieved a grade of seventy five percent on your English subject, um, and your school is affiliated with the Central Board of Secondary Education or the Council for the Indian School Certificate, you will also be exempt or if you're pursuing or have completed the curriculum leading to either the Indian Senior School Certificate or the Indian School Certificate. Those are all exemptions. Otherwise, you will have to take one of the English tests and I will talk about that in a bit. Here's something that's um, relatively new to all universities and particularly new to the uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, the, your academic achievements are very important, of course, and those are reflected in your transcripts. However, University of British Columbia being a university that is more personal, say, than uh, University of Toronto or University of Waterloo, uh, they do want to know about you as a person. And I'm going to say the reason why they care about this so strongly is because they're trying to create a, uh, a community of alumni that will feed the next generation of students. They've done that successfully already for probably two generations. And so a large part of this is if you want information about the University of British Columbia, uh, specifically from a graduate, you can get in touch with the field offices in New Delhi or in Hong Kong and ask to speak to an, an alumnus. So um, in order to, to, to create this sort of circular pattern of creating great leaders and creating great, great mentors, University of uh, British Columbia has created this thing called a personal profile. Uh, what they're trying to get from that is to, to, to hear from you um, what you are most proud of about yourself, what is important to you in the world. And this is a very important issue and a significant issue that you're going to have to think about uh, uh, strongly and, and deeply. Uh, so what, what you have already learned about your experiences inside and outside the classroom. Now, um, I, want, I want to say this. That is what they say. And what they really mean is that they want to know what you're hoping to do in the future. Um, very few students that are applying to university have a great deal of life experience already. If you do, great for you. But it's not uh, the end of the world if you don't have a lot of experience. I mean, 
Uh, most of you are young and most of you haven't had a huge amount of life experience already. However, this is the way that they va evaluate it, your engagement and your accomplishment in the things that you have already done. I'll talk about that in a little bit minute, uh, in, in a minute. Your leadership, uh, which is in various different areas, the substance of what, what you're talking about and your personal voice. Uh, this is something that I've had a lot of students ask me, do they actually want to know really what I'm like or do they want me to say what they want me to say? Depends on the university. This particular university, they actually do want to know who you are personally. So if you have opinions that are slightly off the norm, that's not necessarily a bad thing depending on what the opinions are. Um, so explain how you responded, and here are the questions that they're asking. Explain how you responded to a problem or to an unfamiliar situation. Let's say that you went to a country where you didn't speak the language. Let's say that you started a job at a place where you didn't know anything about it. What did you do and what was the outcome and what did you learn from it? Uh, this is an area where something bad that happened to you can be made into a good thing, where something that, that was a huge challenge, as long as you overcame it. Think, think of it as sort of like the romance novel is there's, there's a challenge that you, oh, that, that, that you uh, overcome. The overcoming is what they're really interested in and how you dealt with the situation. Uh, partly because uh, right now, everything is difficult. Um, everything is difficult in the whole world. The University of British Columbia for this whole year has been entirely online. There hasn't been anybody on the campuses at all. No. There've been some professors in their offices, but for the most part, there's no classes online at all. So the second question is specifically tailored to that area. Give us an example of how the pandemic has changed your involvement in the community or group most important to you. What have you learned from this experience? This is something where uh, you, can, you can do something about that right now to answer that question. Is there something that you personally have thought about that you wanted to do as a reaction to the worldwide pandemic? Um, really, really important issue and one that I really think would be a great way to show who you are and how you've grown as a person. Um, and you can solve that problem right now. Are you volunteering? Are you doing uh, work to raise awareness? Are you uh, helping? You know, there's all kinds of ways to do it now, ways that, you know, that would have been impossible when I was your age. Tell us about who you are. How would your family your friends and or members of your community describe you. Are you the leader? Are you the most, uh, the, 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 the empath? Are you the person who people go to for advice? Are you the person who seeks advice? Are you a leader? Are you a person who, who follows people who are leaders? Um, there's a lot of different ways of uh, uh, framing this, this answer such that you can come, come off as looking as a person that they wanna have at the university. And bear in mind that the university needs to have diversity. And so diversity is extremely important and something that you might wanna think about, <clears throat> how are you? And don't lie about it ever, ever, ever. Because you know, if, if, if you lie, you get there and you're a different person, it sort of skews what they're really looking for. And they are looking for a diverse number of people. The final question is what is important to you and why? This, this subject area, this area um, is, is a kind of a psychological test because there isn't any correct answer to it and there isn't any incorrect answer to it either. There are various gradations are good and bad and indifferent. I think this is something that is um, the, uh, you know, the, the stereotypical Indian aesthetic is one of the holistic person. And it's something that's become increasingly popular in North America <clears throat> and something that I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of Indian students could capitalize on if they knew how important it was to the West. Um, I know that often, often, and I, I encountered this myself when I was applying to foreign universities, I'm trying to think, well, how do I fit into their culture? But actually what they really wanna know is not so much how do you fit into our culture, but how does your culture benefit us? So in other words, if you as a person from X country are going to come to Canada how are you going to influence positively our, our culture? So think about it that way, rather than how can I best become a Canadian? I mean, Canada is a country that is largely made up of immigrants. Um, the overwhelming majority of people uh, are not more than two generations in Canada. So think of, from that perspective, it's not in any way like a lot of European countries. Um, and in some cases, the United States, where it's a 
what they think of as a melting pot where you're trying to blend in. Here, don't try to blend in. Try to be who you really are. Describe five activities that you have pursued or accomplishments you have achieved in one or more of the following areas. Now, um, this is a short answer, but it's a pithy answer. Uh, a club, and this can be any kind of club, where it's, whether it's uh, sports, uh, gosh, it could be a music club, it could be a drama club, it could be a literary society, uh, it could be a poetry society, it could be um, a, a sports team, it could be a chess club, it could be a science club, it could be a photography club, it could be a video club. All these things are important because what it's really about is the, the reason why universities exist and the fundamental reason why they exist is to make better citizens. So if you are already going out and making yourself into a better citizen, they will want you more. So a club, a family, or community responsibilities. In some cases, and, and, and bear in mind, looking, looking after a grandparent, looking after an ailing sibling, those are things that are important because they show the core of who you are. And this university, the University of British Columbia, cares about that deeply. Uh, creative or performing arts. Now here, there's a huge variety of things. If you're in a drumming group, if you're in a, a rock band, if you're in a DJ society, if you're in a dance troupe, if you're in a drama troupe, if you're in some kind of cultural uh, uh, thing, they do want to know about that. Work, employment, athletics, volunteer, service to others, and that's helping a person that needs your help one way or the other. Or other. Now, why am I focusing on this so much? Because this is what distinguishes the University of British Columbia from the other universities that you might be applying to. Uh, mostly, of course, academics are important. Academics are important at every university. There's no university where that's not important. But this one, and just focusing on this personal profile is hugely important. Tell us more about one or two activities listed above that are most important to you the previous ones. Explain the role you played and what you learned in the process. You will be asked for a reference who can speak to your response. In other words, they want you, they want you to talk about this experience and then they want you to prove that you actually did it. Um, additional information. You may wish to use the space below to provide UBC with more information on your academic history to date and your future academic plans. What that means is in some cases, students have a transcript that has one thing that's not kind of perfect. Usually there's a, a real life reason why that grade slipped. And it's not just a matter of, oh, I forgot about it. Uh, it also happens, but that's not what we're focusing on. Um, explain, if you do have something like that in it, explain why that happened. Was it an illness? Was it a family catastrophe? Was it a, a tragedy that happened? Was it a, um, you know, a climate thing? Was it a, a, you know, a natural disaster? What, there's a million different reasons why a grade can, su can suffer. And they do want to know that because there are things like that in life. This is a university that cares about your life up to now. How did you choose your courses in secondary school? Did you pre-plan? Did you just take whatever you were interested in? Both of them can be right. The question is, why did you do it? And because that speaks to who you are. Are there life circumstances that affected your academic decisions today? What have you done to prepare yourself specifically for your intended area of study at UBC? Now that of course is super important because in addition to having the math courses and the science courses, sometimes there are specific courses that would be directly relevant to what you wanna study. And then of course, please submit the names of two referees who know you well. Now, who are these people? They can be an employer if you have a job, a community member, like a distinguished community member, a coach, a teacher, an instructor, or anyone who knows you very well. It can't be, you know, uh, your father or your mother, um, but it can be a person that, that's, uh, that's been your teacher, that has been your instructor. This is different from other universities, by the way. Uh, that can be a teacher or an instructor or anyone who knows you well, uh, and preferably someone who can write it in English and somebody who writes it well. Um, it's it's something that you have to think about. I think a little harder than you might than it might seem on on the paper. I know I, I had the example when I was applying for an academic job that I asked um, a man that I'd worked for for many years to write me a letter of recommendation, and he was not an academic, and consequently he didn't write the the right kind of letter. Uh, it was a positive letter, but it was like not really focusing on the relevant aspects of academic teaching, which was what I was applying for. And, you know, he was talking about how I had a good sense of humor. Um, to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter if you have a good sense of humor or not when you're teaching university, at least not from the perspective of the employer. 
for applicants who are currently attending a high school, one of your referees must be a school official. So that could be either a teacher, a principal, a vice principal, or a, a guidance counselor, uh, or an IB coordinator. And, and none should be a uh, obviously a, a paid agent. I don't know if I needed to say that, but I, I, I think that just to be clear, don't get a, a paid, and because there are people that will offer to do this for you. Do not accept that. It's not going to work. They will know immediately. Okay, here's the, le the less fun part of the presentation. Um, going to a university in Canada is not cheap. Having said that, <clears throat> there are ways of funding your education that are different from other, uh, uh, other countries. Um, as you know, it's, it's significantly cheaper. A Canadian dollar is about somewhere between 72 and 78 cents, depending on the month, uh, American. No. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm not good at this. Um, so $50,000 is um, only, only about $38,000 American. So think about that. <clears throat> it's probably 20 to 25% cheaper to go to school in Canada. Uh, now, here's a question. Is that, is that money well spent? Is that worth your while? Uh, some universities it is, some universities it isn't. There are obviously superior universities in um, the United States, um, but University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, and University of Waterloo uh, and McGill uh, tend to be universities that are, are worth the money. Cost $50,000 uh, to, to, to study applied sciences, commerce, um, and a few other <coughs> uh, of the of the areas that tend to be uh, high income job places uh, in uh, uh, in in the future after you graduate. Arts is it's a little bit cheaper, uh, and uh, interestingly, computer science is relatively inexpensive as well. Which is funny because computer science is very highly rated at University of British Columbia, higher and higher every year too. So um, if you are interested in computer science, I would definitely consider this as a university. Um, various other things, dental hygiene, um, architecture, uh, and environmental design are a little bit uh, cheaper. Oh, uh, we will deal with your question just so you know. Uh, I know somebody just asked me a question. We will uh, deal with that uh, at the end, if that's OK, if you wouldn't mind. Now there are scholarships, uh, but please keep your question and I absolutely will answer it. Um, just refer to back where we were. Um, an International uh, Student Finance Assistance Fund, there's uh, quite a lot of money uh, devoted to that $30 million, um, which sounds like a lot of money, but there's actually also a lot of students, uh, up to, up to 4,000 international students per year. Um, now there's 105 countries represented among the uh, award recipients. Um, a, a large number of them are from, of course, Canada, and a large number of them are also from China and India in that order. Um, and there's, there's been 368 plus international scholars since 2001. So there are scholarships for international students, which is actually different from a lot of universities. This is a, a university that's very focused on the outside world and its connection with Canada. So uh, just do bear that in mind. There are merit scholarships. These, some of them are ones that you, that you don't have to apply for, that you just come naturally with your application and others you have to specifically apply for. Uh, for example, you will be automatically considered for the International Major Entrance Scholarship. Um, it's, and it is not going to cover your whole tuition. Please know that it's not going to cover your entire tuition, but uh, International Major Entrance Scholarships, the IMES, are awarded to exceptional international students entering the undergraduate programs. Students receive their IMES when they enter their first year at UBC, and the scholarships are renewable for up to three years. Uh, sorry, three additional years. So that means your uh, uh, a bachelor program at University of British Columbia is four years, generally speaking. Like there is a three year, but you want to do the honors <coughs> uh, BA. The number and level of these scholarships uh, awarded each year varies depending on available funding. Um, lately, they, they have been down, uh, I'll be honest with you, but, but it's looking uh, for next year like they will be actually uh, quite a bit higher. International uh, Outstanding International Student Award is uh, a one-time merit-based entrance scholarship awarded to qualified students when they are offered admission. Uh, this often is either or. So you either get the Outstanding International Student or the International Major Entrance Scholarship, and both of them are automatic if you apply by January 15th. Uh, but other sc scholarships are the Karen McKellen International Leader of Tomorrow, and this is um, 
uh, a scholarship that recognizes international students who dem demonstrate superior academic achievement, but also leadership skills uh, and involvement in student affairs. Uh, this is generally not offered to incoming students, but students that are currently there and based on their uh, performance during the time. Uh, the Donald Wearung International Student Award recognizes international undergraduate students from impoverished and war-torn areas. Mostly doesn't affect obviously India or China, but um, depends the things things are going on politically right now that are um, difficult for a lot of different countries. Uh, and consider that if you are from a country, I mean, I suppose even Hong Kong might be considered that. Uh, depending on your your experience and and the way things are going, the Vantage One Excellence Award is an award offered to UBC Vantage uh, College uh, for academic outstanding international students who do not yet meet the English language requirement standard. The awards range. Uh, this what this is is a as um, it's an excellence in in your area where you need help in English. Um, so it, it, the, award, the awards range in value for up to the full cost of the student's academic program and living expenses. So it's quite a good program.